Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Blockbuster Movies with me, your host, Buck. And today my guest is the former psychic known as Lullaby. That's me. Yes, it is. When Lullaby was not singing criminals to sleep with her sleepy snoozy song, uh, she was one of my really good friends, so I wanted to bring her in here to get her opinion on a movie that came out before she was born. Uh, today we discussed 1986's puppet-filled classic, Labyrinth. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess that was an intro. Yeah, I mean, it sounded like one. So we just finished watching the movie, and now we are... Recovering. Yes, we are recovering from David Bowie's bulge. <laughs> Uh, I can't get it out of my head. It's just, it's ingrained in there. It's like looking into the sun. It just keeps flashing. Maybe if we distract ourselves by describing the movie, we can remove the image. I mean, I close my eyes and I still see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Uh, so we have the Wikipedia plot, plot summary that <laughs> we're going to be reading out loud and then commenting on because uh, that seemed like the most uh, effective way. And also I'm lazy. And this, this summary was written by some man living in his mom's basement with a bathrobe and then edited by another man living in his mom's basement. Yeah. Also in a bathrobe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I admire them for their steadfastness and their, their trollishness. <laughs> the world's... Knowledge is built on the back of men in bathrobes. Okay, so I'll start. And for anyone that doesn't know, last episode we talked about Beastmaster with my co-host for that episode, Pitch. And we decided to stick with 80s fantasy for this episode. So uh, Labyrinth is one of my favorite movies. I saw it when I was a little kid. Loved it. Lullaby here has actually never seen it. So let's get into it. Labyrinth is a 1986 musical fantasy film directed by Jim Henson, with George Lucas as executive producer. Based on conceptual designs by Brian Froud, the, uh, the film was written by Terry Jones of Monty Python, and many of its characters are played by puppets produced by Jim Henson's Creature Shop. The film stars Jennifer Connelly as 16-year-old Sarah and David Bowie as Jareth, the Goblin King. In Labyrinth, Sarah embarks on a quest to reach the center of an enormous otherworldly maze to rescue her infant half-brother Toby, whom she wished away to Jareth. What was your initial reaction to the movie, having never seen it before? Ah, uh, it took a bit to take in. I'm wondering, does musical fantasy film apply to, like, literally any other film? Like, what other... Uh, let's see, what other... What yeah. other musical fantasies are there? The other 80s fantasy movies I love, like Legend and Neverending Story and Dark Crystal, none of them have songs in them. I mean, I, I feel like I want more now. Like, it was new. It was new, was my reaction. Um, Do we want like a Game of Thrones musical? Oh my gosh. We might. I feel like that'd be better with like a Targaryen opera. Right? Like, it'd be really, like, dramatic and perfect. That could be good. Yeah. So I guess uh, if you want to take it away, we can go into the plot summary for the beginning of the film. 16-year-old Sarah Williams recites from a book titled The Labyrinth in the park with her dog Merlin, but is unable to remember the last line. They are watched by a barn owl. <laughs> Summary's great. <laughs> so creepy. They are watched by a barn owl. She realizes that she's late to babysit her infant half-brother, Toby. She rushes home and is confronted by her stepmother, who leaves for dinner with Sarah's father. Sarah finds Toby in possession in possession <laughs> of her treasured teddy bear, Lancelot. Sarah is frustrated by this, and Toby's constant crying. <laughs> so she rashly wishes Toby be taken away by the goblins from the book. Toby disappears, and the goblin king, Jareth, appears. He offers Sarah her dreams in exchange for the baby, but she refuses, having instantly regretted her wish. Um, I don't remember that. Like, I think I was just bewitched by all the sparkles on his jacket, so I didn't. Yeah, was really oh, focusing. The 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 dreams must be his crystal ball. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. He was like, "Here's this ball," and it has. I thought that was like a like she could see the future in it. I didn't know it would give her. Her dream. It must have been her dreams. Oh. So and we should talk about the crystal ball really quickly. 
the crystal ball is like fluidly like dancing on his hands Mm -hmm. back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading that it wasn't actually David Bowie moving the crystal ball with his hand. It was someone who was like trained to do that, who stuck his arms like under like under David Bowie's arms and was doing it for him. Which is crazy because then you couldn't even see what you were doing. Yeah, so the guy was just blindly doing crystal ball tricks uh, while, like, spooning David Bowie. I wonder if he dropped them on David Bowie's feet at any point. Uh, you mentioned his sparkles. We should talk about his outfit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so his hair is like a pixie mullet? No, like glam rocker mm-hmm. vibe? Mm-hmm. It's like gem. Yes, it's like gem in the holograms. And he's wearing skin tight jegging? leggings really 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 tight gray pants you can see the outline of his manhood um (laughs) the persistent bulge that has been burned into our retinas forever yes yes. this is like the childhood version of the battle of the bulge Mm. i'm gonna cut that (laughs) (laughs) not funny oh oh god yeah let's see where where were we on this description oh yeah Jareth reluctantly gives Sarah 13 hours to solve his labyrinth and find Toby before he turns, he is turned into a goblin forever. Sarah meets a dwarf named Hoggle who aids her to enter the labyrinth. She has trouble finding her way at first and meets a talking worm who inadvertently sends her in the wrong direction. So that description totally left out the fact that when she walks down to the labyrinth, after yelling, come on, feet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, She's like, oh, that's a long way. Let's go, feet. Or like, come on, feet. She first walked down and Hoggle was peeing in a fountain, which is gross. It was a little awkward. Yeah. And yeah, then like he didn't like lie. wash his hands. And then he mm. like immediately oh, like. no. Yeah. He like opened the door. He was handing her stuff the entire yeah, time. Yeah. And he was touching that jewel pouch with those yeah. hands yeah. the whole time. He was touching everything. Yeah. This- he- Pee is sterile, but still, like, stop touching everything with your pee hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm going to have to reevaluate the whole film in light of that. Mm-hmm. It's not very sanitary. Mm-mm. Um, so, yeah, Hoggle looks like a like a mythological little dwarf character. He has a lot of things dangling mm-hmm. across him. Oh, and he was killing fairies. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He had, like, a... A little spritzer. <laughs> it was like it was like a like pesticide spray, mm, essentially, that sad. he was using to kill fairies that were flying around. What do you think it was? What kind of spray kills fairies? Bleach? <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. Um, okay, so he killed fairies. My favorite part of the movie was the sound that the fairies made when they died. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of them did bite Sarah, so it probably deserved to die. So Yeah. Oh, the talking worm. We didn't, we didn't talk about mm. the worm. You asked a question while we were watching about the worm because he's like, come in and have a cup of tea and meet the missus. He lives in like a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> like how what are you doing that? I don't think that she would have been able to, you know, get in there. Um, so that worm is very stupid. I don't think that was a practical uh, really offer at all. Yeah. And uh um, Probably not genuine. And this adorable little blue British worm um, is wearing a red scarf, which is very cute. But how did he get the scarf on? How did he tie the scarf? He does not have fingers. How does he brew tea? How does he drink tea? Is he even married? Yeah, he says meet the missus. But I mean, it's not like they wear rings on fingers because they don't have fingers. He lied about the right direction to go, you know? Yeah. And yeah. he's got a scarf that nobody knows uh, how he got it on. Maybe David Bowie's coming by and putting his scarf on for him. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're tight. Yeah. And he doesn't even have a home. He's just sitting on a rock because he's a worm. It's true. Yeah, it's very confusing. Mm-hmm. After she meets the worm and then she goes in the wrong direction the next thing in the description is that she ends up in an oubliette where she reunites with Hoggle. What's an oubliette? It was like that dark pit that she fell into. Oubliette? Like, who even knows that word? They did say the word oubliette, like, multiple times in the movie. I feel like it would have registered. Maybe it didn't make it past the retinal burn of the manhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ball just overwhelmed our senses. I feel, yes. I was stunned. <laughs> I was <laughs> psychologically paralyzed by it. Um, can I just say, and that 
Okay, this is the last thing I'll just say about the bulge, probably. <laughs> what? Like, you have a legion of little people actors on this show who are right at the height of the bulge. And you're like, why don't we just put really, really tight pants and fully emphasize every wrinkle and and bulge here and you're and then have him gyrate in front of you. Like I feel like they should have gotten hazard pay for this. <laughs> Cause they're just right they're right there. And when they cut to these little people goblins, it's like bulge on one side, goblin on the other, because that's what's happening down there. And I just I just really feel for them is what is the point I want to make. Mm-hmm. I just want to put that out there. So it just says Sarah ends up in an oubliette, but it doesn't mention how she got there. Mm. She had to answer a riddle, oh. which I still don't know if the riddle, if she, if she answered it correctly, because it was like one of them always tells the truth and one of them always lies. Mm-hmm. But like, I still wasn't exactly sure if she answered it correctly because I don't care. But yes. <laughs> yes. I feel like that's an important, an important aspect to this because she was very certain and I was... Very bored. She convinced me, though. Like, I believed, like, <laughs> when she explained why she picked the the door that she picked, mm-hmm. I believed her. And she convinced me, but then she still fell down into a hole. So, oh, and also when she falls into the oubliette, she meets the helping hands. Um, so the whole, the whole hole, uh, like, l- falling down into the oubliette, it's lined with hands that are essentially, like, grope her viciously grope her and mm-hmm. throw her down into the pit but they grab her halfway through and they're like hey we're the helping hands which way do you want to go and this dumb dumb girl is like oh well i'm already pointed down so let's just keep falling into the dark pit she literally could have just said oh bring me back up and then she would have gone back up and walked on probably right to the castle mm-hmm. so maybe that was the right door to pick but she just was dumb and because oh. the helping hands were there to help her go on further. Mm-hmm. But she was too dumb to realize that. And she just was like, let's keep falling. Oh. Mm-hmm. This is a lesson, like a moral lesson, like accept the helping hands mm-hmm. as they grope you. Yeah. Oh, um, um, and right before that, like before she falls into the oubliette, they totally leave out the, the number, the dance number, the dance magic dance number. He's in a... Uh, Throne room with goblins everywhere. Oh, yeah. Throwing a baby up into the yeah. air. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorite parts. Is this little sort of like plastic baby that's going 10 feet in the air. And then he just turns away like, oh, maybe a goblin will catch it. Maybe not. Yeah. And it looked like he was like kicking a goblin across the room. And like there's like chickens everywhere. Oh, yeah. The chickens are yeah. great. Like who is just like, can we just add some chickens? Like, <laughs> Yeah. They're like, let's have everything as a puppet. Except the chickens. Let's have real chickens. Mm-hmm. But there was like one like bird I saw flying that was like an, a goblin. It looked like a little dragon maybe or like a little goblin chicken. That was like slow motion like flying through yeah, the air. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I noticed um, that too. But I it sounded like one of the lyrics in that song was slap that baby, make him pee. But I think it was <laughs> make him free maybe. I, I don't want to check the lyrics. I don't care enough to check. But mm. it I like growing up, I always thought the lyric was "slap that baby, make him pee." That sounds and right. So when I sing along, that's what I say. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, wait. When you sing along, I, I, how? What would you say the frequency is of this musical number coming up in your home where you're singing along to it? And what are you wearing? Um, I'm wearing pajamas typically because <laughs> I normally watch this whenever I'm in a bout of depression. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it brings me back to happy, nostalgic, good times. Uh-huh. Um, but like the older I get, the more uncomfortable I become with David Bowie's bulge. <laughs> like the when bulge. I was, when I was younger, I, I didn't even question it. Mm-hmm. I didn't even think about it. Like, and it was, I saw it before I came out of the closet. So I wasn't even like thinking about male genitalia on a regular basis. <laughs> um, but like, especially like I went to see like the Nutcracker when I was young and I didn't even think like, oh, you can see that man's. Um, mm-hmm. you know, penis, <laughs> out, uh, penis outline. So like, I didn't even think of it and I don't want to sexualize people doing their like art form mm-hmm. or anything, mm-hmm. but like they're sex organs. So like, I can't not sexualize sex mm-hmm. organs. Mm-hmm. Um, Makes sense. But I, I mean, it's I very know. visual though, among the costume, like the lines of the costume lead your eyes down and it's all very like 
Like there are all these different lines and crazy hair and sparkles and all this stuff that is just distracting. Yeah. And then you get to the lower portion, it's just streamlined, tight gray. And the yeah. only interruption to that is the bulge. So it's like, it's yeah. very simple and clean and the bulge. Yeah. And the gray pants are very like smooth. Yeah. Like it's like one big smooth plane. And the mm-hmm. only interruption in that plane is right. is, is the shadowy indentation. Right. Like put twixt. some sparkles on there. Yeah. <laughs> twixt. <laughs> yeah. Twixt the thighs. But okay. So you haven't heard it yet because I haven't released any of them. But the whole last episode was pretty much just Pitch and I talking about Beastmaster's thighs. And, I, and all the thighs that we would see in the film. So maybe maybe the 80s was just a bad time for below the waist for men mm. in movies. Could be like you get into like a, a, you know, like a theme or whatever where everybody's like, oh. Yeah. We don't care about like waist up. It's all about below the waist. We want to make you uncomfortable. We want to make you think, you know, we want to accentuate things that maybe weren't accentuated in the past. Okay. So it's my turn to read. Sarah ends up in an oubliette where she reunites with Hoggle. The two are confronted by Jareth, escape one of his traps, and encounter a large beast named Ludo. Ludo. But that whole that was one sentence that they just described like oh, yeah. a big chunk of stuff. They didn't mention the guy with the talking hat. Um, oh yeah, that guy was awesome. Yeah, like between escaping the oubliette and meeting Ludo, they ran into this old guy with a bird for a hat. They kept arguing with each other, which the I thought- The bird was like really passive aggressive mm-hmm. um, and he was very tired. That was one of my favorite characters though, was just like the bickering, like the moment between the guy and his hat. Mm-hmm. And then the I bird agree. at the end was like, oh, you try being one of his hats. It was, or <laughs> yeah. s- something like that. Yeah, something like that. And then, yeah, like they escape a trap, which is really just like two goblins, like on like a bicycle pedal seesaw, like behind this giant- spinning metal thing that looked like oh, a garbage yeah, disposal cleaner yeah yeah and then they yeah climb a ladder get out meet this guy with a hat and then oh um she gave him a plastic bracelet because mm-hmm. hoggle's really into jewelry he has a, a kink or a fetish i think mm-hmm. um he collects anything that might be shiny or pretty or uh jewel related so the plastic bracelet that she gives him just like makes his day um and like when she donates a ring from her finger into the old man with the bird hats like donation box, I thought Hoggle was going to like kill himself because he looks so miserable. He was like, oh, how dare you give away that jewel that probably cost you like three coins in a little machine somewhere. <laughs> it's true. What about Ludo? I mean, that's kind of a big thing. First of all, why is he being tortured upside down in a tree like poked at? Wait. Did we talk about the goblins with the fetus dinosaurs on sticks yet? No, that's this part. Yeah, so the description just says that, let's see, it says, Hoggle flees in a cowardly fashion while Sarah befriends Ludo after freeing him from a trap, but then loses him in a forest. Yeah, see, it keeps skipping over the actual fun parts. Like five goblins with oversized helmets Mm -hmm. attack attack him, essentially, with... What do you call them? Dinosaur fetuses? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have like giant, terrifying, like gaping maws of teeth. Uh, uh, they're horrifying. And why? And then they keep like accidentally biting each other with their dinosaur fetus sticks. Also, why? Like, what are they What are they doing? Are they just torturing him? And why are they wearing a full body armor, but yet it's still thin enough for their own creatures to bite through with their mm. giant teeth? Like they're wearing like thin leather pants, I think, but full body armor. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Like, what's the point of an oversized helmet if a monster bites through your butt? Right. Oh, and you noticed something that I've never seen. I've seen this movie a million times, and I've never noticed that the helmets of those goblins with the, the demon sticks have numbers on them. Yeah. Why? Like, one was like five, yeah. one was like three or something, mm-hmm. and I'd never noticed that they had numbers on their helmets before. I don't know if there's relevance to that, hmm. but I kind of want to look it up now. Not now, now. I mean, like, later, because no one's going to want to listen to me Google something. (laughs) (laughs) I do. Okay, so Hoggle flees in a cowardly fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it says Sarah befriends Ludo after freeing him from a trap, but loses him in the forest. So it says loses him from the forest, but they didn't say how they got to the forest. They had knockers that they talked to. The, oh yeah, yeah. There, see, this plot summary that was sucks. A whole thing. Yeah, there was a whole a whole section mm. where there are two door knockers that are really sassy, 
and one of them has the knocker like the knocking ring in its mouth which Ludo pulls out and then puts in his own mouth which is like the cutest thing in the movie it is and then yeah so then she she has to shove it back in his mouth which is really gross if you think about it mm. because it was in Ludo's mouth mm-hmm. probably full of like monster saliva and then shoved right back into this knocker's mouth for possibly all of eternity so that leaves oh, a bad really taste depressing. in his mouth yeah so they they talk to the knockers and I'm trying my best not to make like a knocker joke like oh look at those knockers oh god it's a kids movie so I I mm-hmm. shouldn't I shouldn't you, do that no you shouldn't so they go into a forest Hoggle encounters Jareth. Oh, by the way, they like introduce his name as Jareth partway through it, but at the beginning they only call him the Goblin King. Right, because then he's like, "Ah, oh, let's get this Jareth," and I was like, "What, Jared? Like the subway guy?" And you were like, "No, he's not a part of this movie." But I feel like that's possible. Uh, okay, so yeah, let, let's talk about the peach. Jareth gives Hoggle an enchanted peach and instructs him to give it to Sarah, calling his loyalty into question as he was supposed to take her back to the beginning of the labyrinth. Sarah is harassed by a group of creatures called the Fire Gang, but Hoggle comes to her aid. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the Fire Gang, the, the Fireies. Um, one of them has the voice of Elmo, which... I know from, I guess, listening to Elmo a lot. <laughs> I, I used to have like um, one of my Did cousins. Did you have an Elmo a, doll? I didn't, but one of my cousins had a Tickle Me Elmo doll. And like that voice is just ingrained in my memory forever. Uh, like David Bowie's bulge. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. But yeah, so it's creepy having these like little orange fire monsters ripping their heads off and trying to like throw them at her and rip her head off. Um, while one of them is Elmo. Oh I, my I, God. I just can't. I felt like the movie was giving me drugs as I was what? Like, I didn't know what was happening. Like, did I just take drugs? What is there? What is happening? Oh, you said the goblins were like meth heads? Oh, yeah. So we decided that the target audience for this film is is drug, people on drugs, right? Mm-hmm, so this, mm-hmm. So that that made sense. And suddenly it really started to make sense. And we decided like each group of sort of creatures is a different kind of drug, mm-hmm. person on drugs. Yeah. So meth head goblins. Or no, crack. Oh. Meth head goblins. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Crack head fire people, right? Like they're ripping their heads off. Or, or were those bath salts? Bath salts, yeah. The, the fireys were we on modified bath salts. That. Okay. And then Ludo was just kind of like a friendly, big, dopey stoner. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ludo's a stoner. Yeah. Smell bad. <laughs> because it's so dank. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's hungry too as they're walking. He's like, oh, yeah. I'm hungry. Yeah. And Sarah just ignores him. She's like, oh, this peach, suck it, Ludo. Yeah. But Ludo is really my favorite character in mm-hmm. this in this thing. He's just so cute and funny, but like also big um, and adorable. It's true. All right. So the next thing it says is that she kisses Hoggle and then they fall through a trap door that sends them to the... <laughs> I can't even read this. It says it sends them to a flatulent swamp called the Bog of Eternal Stench. <laughs> <laughs> where they reunite with Ludo. So is this like like stoner farts or something? So okay, so I have a lot like to say. You're eating a lot of Cheetos and mm-hmm. um, I mean, sliders. Oh God, uh, I need to say a lot about the bog of eternal stench. Mm. So first of all, the actual bog. Looking at it is like greenish brown mucky water filled with with sputtering rectums. Mm. It's it, not good. No, like the older I get, and the more I the more I watch it, the grosser it is and they keep zooming in they're like Pfft. yeah it's just like sputtering gross like farting it's 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 not cool like fart mm. jokes are funny but mm. th- this is is too wet <laughs> yeah and too yeah mm. um so, yeah i felt funny i felt funny about it yeah and i I, I thought of the Bog of Eternal Stench as the Chekhov's gun of this movie. So like, you know, like when a gun is introduced into something, like it has to go off by the end of the the play or, you know, whatever it is. So they keep mentioning the Bog of Stench, the Bog of Stench. So like, you know, it's going to come. It's like, you know, the stench is going to happen. So when they finally get there, it's grosser than I was anticipating. So how is it that, you know, that guy, Fox guy and bro. No, uh, Didymus. Didymus, yeah. So he has lived his entire life guarding this bog, right? He doesn't smell it. How has he never touched the water? Because he didn't smell when they left. Yeah, and, and his dog too. So he has dog with his big 
hanging sheepdog hair. Yeah, they must reek of stench all the time. Yeah. Because they live there. So next, next, the trio, the trio of Hoggle, Sarah, and Ludo, meet the guard of the swamp, who we just discussed, the anthropomorphic fox, Sir Didymus, and his sheepdog steed, Ambrosius, who is really just Sarah's dog, Merlin, from the beginning of the movie, but like with a new name. And sometimes a puppet, and sometimes not. Yes, and uh, with a saddle. And I want to know who knighted Sir Didymus. Oh, good point. Like, he's a fox with an eye patch. Like, has he seen war? Has he seen a lot of battle? He's missing an eye. Uh, It says, Ludo summons a trail of rocks to save Sarah from falling into the bog, and Didymus joins the group. Once again, they just summarized a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ludo and Didymus fought each other, and then uh, Ludo kind of won, so Didymus was like, you Mm. are my, you know, brave, valiant uh, compatriot or brother brother yeah yeah he says you are my brother oh we didn't even talk about ludo summoning the rocks oh yeah which was interesting do we know any heroes that summon rocks is that a thing i mean we just he says that rocks friends rocks friends mm. so we just have to believe it you know suspension of disbelief we just have to believe ludo summons rocks with you know telekinesis or geokinesis would it be? it was Maybe. it was his song his rock yeah. song. Mm-hmm. So he's like you. He he has uh, magical song powers. Oh. You sing people to sleep and he sings rocks to m- move. <laughs> I, I think I'd prefer that. I mean, you could probably do a lot more crime fighting with rocks than with, you know, lullabies. How does he control them, though? They just sort of roll. Maybe he's like Magneto and like there's metal ore in the rocks and he can mm. control metal. I don't That's know. a good thought because not all the rocks move. Yeah. That reminds me, I know like X-Men is just like a fake comic book thing, but there's a real life version of them um, in Rose City that I just learned about. Um, They called themselves the Sex Men. Uh, (laughs) They are a group of former porn actors and actresses that are trying to get into the superhero business. Um, So there is Professor XXX is their leader. Oh my. And then there was a guy with one eye named Cucklops. He either watched people creepily with, with his one eye. That's why they called him Cucklops. Mm. Yeah, I think that was it. And then there was this really hairy guy um, with um, dicks growing out of his hand. They called him Wolverpeen. Oh, my God. <sighs> um, yeah, when he'd get angry, like, they'd harden up and he'd use them as weapons on his oh, hand. Oh, my. Yeah. I don't know. I have no words. And the last one was this this um, telepathic lady who controlled things with her vagina. Um, she called herself Vagine Gray. Wow. See, that's what I'm talking about with the rocks. Mm-hmm. She's okay. Yeah. So similar power. Maybe we're related. Please tell me, though, one of the sex men wears something similar to the David Bowie Goblin King outfit. Because that is too hot to waste. I can't think of anyone. I There is a henchman that I remember Pitch telling me about named David Bowie Knife. Pretty much uh, <laughs> just looks like... <laughs> I don't, I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, he just looks like David Bowie, but he uses a Bowie Knife to like attack people. Where did these people get their names from? I feel like we sat around talking about names forever. I mean, you used to be Snoozy Susie, <sighs> so you shouldn't be talking. Fair point. Ugh, I'm sorry. That was, I didn't mean to ever bring that up. Low blow. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, let's keep going with this plot summary because we're never going to finish okay, otherwise. Okay, true, true. So the group gets hungry. So Hago gives Sarah the peach and runs away as she falls into a trance and forgets her quest. Worth noting, the whole group is like, I'm starving. And she's like, I don't know, maybe there's some berries or something. And Hago's like, here's this big peach. And she's like, great. And She just selfishly was like, ah, ah, ah. It's so like, you know, that's what you get, I think, when you don't share with poor Big Ludo. So she's in a trance. She has a dream where Jareth comes to her in a masquerade ball, which, by the way, her outfit was kind of awesome. 80s awesome. Mm -hmm. So he proclaims his love for her, which is weird, right? Because he's like in his 40s and she's like 15. Yeah, she's a teenage girl Mm. and he's a full grown man. Oh, so so um, in keeping with that, she rebuffs him and escapes, falling into a junkyard outside the Goblin City near Jarrah's castle. That was like my favorite environment 
like just like a bunch of wicker for some reason. Like there was a hurricane in Florida and all the retirees furniture just like landed <laughs> outside of the Goblin City and and then had cobwebs and sparkles on top of it. I was like, I was into it. Oh my God. <laughs> An old junk lady fails to brainwash her and she's rescued by Ludo and Sir Didymus. I was taking notes during this and mm-hmm. I, I wrote down that the junk lady is like the bizarro world um, Mary Kondo. Um, instead of like getting rid of things that, that um, don't spark joy, she actually just piles trash onto people and tries to get them to feel joy. She's like, more, more. Don't you want this? Don't you like this? She's a pusher. <laughs> <laughs> she was. What is the meaning of that, do you think? Like, what's the moral of this story? For me, like, I have trouble getting rid of old things, like stuffed animals even, or because oh. uh, I used to, like, before I realized that I could talk to them and they would insult me every day, I loved animals. <laughs> I just, I loved animals so much. I had a ton of like beanie babies, like any animal stuff I would kind of hoard. But then like, there are certain things I still have that I I can't donate or or give away or even throw in the garbage because like, I just get happy memories thinking about like where I was, like if I was at like a craft fair with my mom Mm -hmm. uh, and like, I saw like a little wooden squirrel and I was like, Hey, I want that squirrel. So it makes me think of like, when I was with my mom, uh, it, less of like when squirrels attack me, because um, mm-hmm. that happens all the time now. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I know, laugh at me. No, it just, I find joy when the squirrels attack you because you're so big and the squirrels are so small and you are so scared. It brings joy to my heart. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm not that scared. Like I can handle a squirrel. Yeah. You just kind of swat them away and scream though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh. No, I would never do that. No. No, not me. Oh, have I ever told you about the labyrinth drinking game? The drinking game is that every time that you see David Bowie's balls, you take a drink. Ooh. So that's painful. It's not I think it's like taking a sip though, not like taking a shot. Because if, if it was so. a shot, you'd be dead from like blood alcohol poisoning. Yeah. I mean, is it like every cut you see it or like every second it remains on screen and every time you're zoomed closer? Um, I think like it's whenever it just whenever it draws your attention. Oh, so constantly. Yes, so okay. just constantly, <laughs> constantly <laughs> sipping the entire the entire film. Okay, uh, let's get back to the summary. So, what happens mm-hmm. after Ludo and Sir Didymus rescue her from the junk lady? The, oh, this was my favorite part. They are confronted by a humongous robotic gate guard, but Hago comes to the rescue. Okay, it's one sentence for all of that awesomeness. This robotic like transformer but somehow medieval gate guard who's just like awkwardly swinging a giant axe that hits nobody um but is awesome at the same time and then hago comes yanks his head off and there's there's some little goblin in there who seems confused and um and then he pulls him out by his head and chucks him to the ground and then he runs away my favorite part of the sequence was when Sir Didymus was losing control of his steed, his his dog, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Ambrosius. <laughs> and this dog like reared up, it bucked up, and it neighed like a horse, mm. and then it like whimpered and ran away. It was it was really funny. That was that was one a wonderful moment. And and then it says at the end, despite his feeling unworthy of forgiveness for his betrayal, Sarah and the others welcome. Hoggle back, and they enter the city together. So they forgave Hoggle for the peach Mm -hmm. incident. And she gave him his jewelry pouch back, and he was like, ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah, his his jewels. And she was like, your pee hands touched all over this, and I no longer want it. Oh, a call back to the pee hands (laughs) comment. I'm just, it's there. It's in in, in my mind. (laughs) And uh, in her hands now. (laughs) What what was next? Uh... Oh, here it is. Jareth is alerted to the group's presence and sends his goblin army to stop them. Ludo summons a multitude of rocks. Whoever wrote this decided that multitude, multitude. was the best word. Mm. He summons a multitude I mean, of rocks uh, to chase the goblins away, and then they enter the castle. Imagine the look of satisfaction on their face as they type in multitude, enter. Yeah. Take that, Wikipedia. Do you like how the entire long battle sequence was just summarized in one sentence? Oh, that's true. Just says he summons rocks to chase away the goblins and they enter the castle. That's the entire thing. Oh, yeah. And that was an awesome, like, we can't, 
not talk about the chicken set (laughs) chickens so many chickens like do you think the chickens were written in to begin with was on the script does it say and chickens or was someone's like you know what this scene needs chickens and then they happened i mean nothing makes something look more authentically as like a lived in sort of town or village Mm -hmm. than chickens wandering the the cardboard streets that's true (laughs) (laughs) more chickens oh god and yeah, I, I mean, if Ludo was hungry enough, if he had the time, he would have maybe stopped and eaten one of the chickens. But I don't think he would have. He's like, like a gentle giant. I feel like he's more of an herbivore. Mm-hmm. Uh, as in like he's smoking the herb. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I say that, but I've never actually tried pot. So um, it's probably for the best. Yeah. I mean, I'm anxious and paranoid enough as it is. Just <laughs> my natural state. Imagine if then squirrels came after you. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. No, not not for me. Sorry. Best not. Best not. No, no. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Where were we here? Okay. Uh, let's see. Multitude okay, yeah. of rocks. Yeah, so mom- that totally derailed us, by the way. I have a clear picture of the man who typed multitude of rocks and hit enter. Yes. Um, Continue. Yes. After they enter the castle, Sarah insists she must face Jareth alone and promises to call the others if needed. So they went all this way to fight to the castle just to abandon her and be like, all right, teenage girl, we are seasoned you know, battle veterans with like an eye patch, but we're going to let the teenage girl go and fight the Goblin King. Yeah. What's up with that? I think they're just cowards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I still, I, I need to, the, the backstory of Sir Didymus's eye patch. Maybe he just like tripped oh. and fell and he like poked his eye on his own what sword. What do you think is likely that? Yeah. I feel like that's likely because it's a very pokey sword. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sarah insists she must faith. Oh, I can't say face Jareth because I want to keep saying faith, yeah. J- faith, yeah. Jer- faith Jareth. I don't know. I mean, how do they go through like the the read of this script without everyone just being like, wah, 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 yeah. Wah. I mean, I already am insecure enough about being a you know a gay man public like public figure. So saying Jareth makes me feel like I have a lisp sometimes. So I'm mm. trying to like avoid that. But I understand. I'm not shaming people with lisps. I'm just trying to uh, be a little bit more discreet with my um, flamboyance. Maybe you could say the Goblin King. Yes, yeah, I'll just change every Jareth to Goblin King. I don't King. even know why he needs a name. Like he's why does he have it? Like who is no, he? No, the anonym the uh, another word I can't say. He's the, mysterious. The anonymity of Goblin King or is kind of nice. Okay. This is when it gets trippy. Mm. In a room, just here. Yeah. <laughs> Nowhere else. Just here. Perfectly normal. All the drug induced fantasy numbers and throwing a baby and, and the talking hands. Uh, that was all fine. That but, baby throw was but awesome. This part's trippy when gravity is is um, played with. Uh, in a room modeled after M.C. Escher's relativity, she confronts Jareth while trying to retrieve Toby. So the baby's climbing upside down up staircases, and it's this whole musical number where he's like singing and flipping all around, walking on the ceiling, and the baby isn't he like some like it's some love thing where he's like ah you yeah, are it, it, yeah I felt like a put love me song. upside down or, and I was yeah like, ooh. he's like ooh I love you um, it wasn't that creepy though even though no. he's old and she's like a young teenager yeah it didn't feel as creepy as it probably should have he didn't deliver creepy even though the setup was Mm -hmm. creepy yeah if it was any other performance it could have been really creepy but i didn't i didn't get the creep vibe right so she confronts him oh it doesn't mention the costume change so before i read this next line (laughs) we have to mention his costume change how could they leave that out yeah i don't know so there's a last minute costume change where he is wearing this like whitish creamish almost brownish giant cloak that we thought was fur but then we looked a little bit closer and it was hair Mm -hmm. it's like a hair cloak it looked like he skinned targaryens alive and their their blonde tresses were just (laughs) turned into a cloak it is and then once we noticed that like i don't even know what else happened in that scene because i was obsessed with the hair cloak i was like what is happening with the hair cloak Mm -hmm. and oh oh but the lighting too it really like accentuated and put a big harsh shadow right on his bulge (laughs) <laughs> yes, it was. I think it was a costume change for the gray leggings. Like, I feel like they got tighter. They're like, can we get the smalls in these? Because this is a big scene. We got the hair cloak. Get the smalls. Mm-hmm. A big scene for a big peen. <laughs> just gotta, just gotta, gotta Cause show we, it. Because we were both totally distracted. Like, I don't even know if you remember what happened. There was like hair cloak, bulge. Like, what is going on? 
I don't, I don't understand. Um, okay. So after the costume change, she recites the lines from her book that mirror her adventure to that point, which is how the movie started. She was reciting lines and couldn't remember the last one. Mm -hmm. Because of the bulge in the hair cloak. And then Jareth offers Sarah her dreams again with the crystal balls. But then (laughs) she rejects his balls and, and remembers the line finally, which is, you have no power over me. And then uh, he's defeated at the last second, right before the clock is about to strike. Uh, I was going to say midnight, but it was 13 o'clock because it was 13 hours. Yeah. So I can't say midnight, but 13 o'clock. Uh, and then Sarah and Toby return home safe and sound. Um, Jareth turns into a barn owl. Which at that point finally like explained the intro to me. I was like, oh, he's an owl. I like when he disappeared too. It was like this flurry of fabric. I was like, what's yeah? What's happening to the hair cloak? The, I think the hair cloak transformed into barn owl feathers. Ah, oh, that makes sense. It was a similar color palette. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So then, um, Sarah realizes how important Toby is to her. That's sweet. She was a total B to him earlier. Like he's crying. This poor kid. I'm like, I don't even know what they did to him. Like as a you know, like, did he have poos in his pit? Like, why? Yeah, it's been hours. So, like, he's probably pooed himself. I doubt. I doubt the, do, do the goblins have diapers? Mm, that's true. I can't imagine they would. That's like, why he was crying, like, the entire movie, because he kept pooping himself. Yep. Yeah, he was full of poo. All right. So, okay. so what does Sarah do after uh, she realizes she Toby's important? She then realizes how important Toby is to her. She gives him Lancelot and returns to her room just as her father and stepmother return home. She sees her friends in the mirror, meaning her friends from this labyrinth world, and admits that even though she is grown up, she still needs them in her life. So some imagination, I guess. I don't know. Whereupon, whereupon? <laughs> oh, that's multitude Yeah, guy. multitude of rocks. Whereupon. <laughs> whereupon, the labyrinth characters appear in her room for a raucous reunion party. A raucous reunion party. <laughs> they use whereupon and raucous in the same sentence. I mean, someone was feeling ambitious. Uh, Jareth, as an owl, watches their celebration from outside and then flies into the moonlight with a visible, like, green screen plate sort of situation around him, a visible edge. Yeah. Elliot. Shh. Yeah, sorry if you had to hear that. Um... Our uh, friend recalls Cat Elliot is kind of being cat sitted right now, so um, he's begging for food, and it's a little dramatic. Hmm. Thanks, Elliot. It's not dinner time yet. Shut it. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. So that's the whole summary, right? Hmm. That, that's that's the whole I think thing. I, I feel like we've covered it all. Do you believe that it was real or all a dream? Do you think the whole thing was was just a fever dream? Yeah. I think, I mean, I think it was. But the gall of this woman to believe that she has grown up from a child to an adult after a four hour dream, Mm. like it doesn't work that way. You have to put in the work. Mm -hmm. That's true. And also during this dream, your brother is pooping himself and crying and you're ignoring it while having this dream. Mm -hmm. Sarah might be a psychopath. Yeah. She's crazy. Like he's just crying. Right? Like, he clearly needs something at the beginning. He's tears running down his face. Like, I don't even know how that, like, is, o- is okay uh, production-wise. And she's just like, ugh, I wish she would go away. And then as soon as he does, she's like, oh, crap. Uh, I, I take it back. Okay. The other question I had was about a rating system. So the last episode we developed a rating system based on pitch's powers so since she creates sonic screams we rated it out of five shrieks and so i guess out of five what works for a sleepy z's um yeah sleepy z's because you make people sleep so out of five z's um what would your rating for this movie be how many z's well like what's good like one z because it didn't make me fall asleep or like five z's because like um, five stars like five shrieks was the best out of five Mm. typically like if it's five out of five that's the best but five z's will would imply that it's more boring Mm. so 
I think I don't know. Oh, sheep. Let's do sheep because you yeah. count you count sheep while you're sleeping. Okay. And sheep are cute. So out of five sheep, um, how, how many? Chickens? How many? Yes. Okay. You know what? It doesn't even matter at this point. Let's just do. Yeah. We can relate chickens to sleep because because the crowing of a rooster in the morning signifies waking up. Yeah. Uh, so it's all in there somewhere. Chickens are really just the foundation of this film as well. You know, I think mm-hmm. whether people realize it or not. Um, yeah. Without um, chickens, this is nothing. Okay. Yeah. So out of five, how many chickens would you rate mm. this movie? Well, I mean, on on the whole, like it's a. Uh, I get. I'd have to give it. Probably probably five chickens. Five out of five chickens? Five out of five chickens. It's just, it is a whirlwind of color and uh, drug-induced confusion, which I find delightful. I don't know how, you know, many drug-filled weekends the people who created this movie had, um, but certainly at least five or six. So I think it's great. It's pretty unique. So I don't. I never know how to end this. Just el- end it with a squelching fart noise. <laughs> yeah, let's just let's just go out making fart sounds. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Yes, this has been Blockbuster Movies, and. <laughs> <laughs>